This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Hello. Welcome back to our ongoing series of lessons on what the Bible teaches about angels produced by our good friends at World Video Bible School in Maxwell, Texas. My name is Travis L. Quitermas, and I'll be your teacher for this series of lessons. For the past 20 plus years, there's been a wave of angel mania. People have been writing books on the subject. I myself wrote a book on the subject. Uh, people have produced movies and documentaries, and there have been all kinds of sensational claims made about angels. I wrote a book on the subject initially to address some of those misconceptions as well as to set forth an in-depth study of what the Bible teaches on angels. More in-depth, in fact, than we are able to do in, even in this series of 13 lessons. If you have enjoyed this series and you would like to know even more about what the Bible teaches on the subject, then let me recommend to you my book, The Host of Heaven, A Biblical Study of Angels. My book was published by... Brother Sam Hester and, Sam and Hester Publications in Henderson, Tennessee, and it's widely available through a number of our Brotherhood bookstores. As I teach and preach on the subject of angels, one of the most commonly asked, in fact, I would say the most commonly asked question I receive is this, what about guardian angels? Maybe that question has already occurred to you as you have watched this series of lessons. In 1994, Time Magazine did a survey about what people believed about angels. And they found that 46% of the American people believe that they have a guardian angel. Now, if you remember an earlier lesson in this series on the work of angels, we pointed out that one of the four works that God has given His angels is to guard and protect His children. And I mentioned then that the Bible teaches there are angels who guard but not guardian angels, at least as the denominational world defines that doctrine. And I told you we would be having a more in-depth study of the subject and in this lesson and in the next lesson, we are going to seek a biblical answer to the question, do you have a guardian angel? Again, the Bible teaches there are angels who guard, but not guardian angels. Now you may be asking yourself, Brother Travis, that sounds like a distinction without a difference to me. Are we playing word games? No, we're really not. In this first lesson, I want to show you the difference between angels who guard and guardian angels. We want to define the doctrine very carefully. We want to compare it against the Scripture. And then we want to look at some of the proof texts that are misapplied where the question, the doctrine of guardian angels is concerned. Now, the Bible does teach there are angels who guard. Let me give you two passages in your Bible that you can look at with me. I'll be teaching from the New King James Version of the Bible. Turn with me in your Bibles, first of all, to Daniel chapter 6. This is the well-known story of Daniel in the lion's den. You remember that Daniel's political enemies connived to have Daniel cast into a den of lions very much against the wishes of the king, but he had been tricked into signing a law that nonetheless condemned Daniel to death. And the law of the Medes and the Persians had an unusual quirk that once it was signed into law, not even the king could revoke it. So sadly, the uh, king Darius had his favorite servant cast into the den of lions. He spent a sleepless night worrying about the fate of his favored servant Daniel. The next morning he went early to the den of lions. He ordered the stone rolled away. Let's pick up the reading in Daniel chapter 6 in verse number 20. The Bible says, And when he came to the den, he cried out with a, lam a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, 
O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him and also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Then the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. So notice then that God sent one of his lions or one of his angels, and that angel played the role of the lion tamer. And he tamed that ferocious, savage pride of lions so that Daniel had not even a scratch on him. Now let's look at an example from the New Testament. In Acts chapter 5, we find that the Jewish authorities have thrown the twelve apostles into prison. And let's pick up the reading in Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. The Bible says... Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught, But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside." Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priests heard these words, they wondered what the outcome would be. Then one of them came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. So here we see that God sent an angel who miraculously engineered a wonderful jailbreak for the apostles of Jesus Christ, and they went about their work of teaching and preaching the gospel. So here are two examples then of angels sent by God from heaven to earth to guard and protect His faithful children. So the Bible teaches there are angels who guard. But what about the doctrine of guardian angel? Now here, as the old saying goes, is a horse of a different color. What exactly do we mean when we talk about guardian angels? Friends and brethren, we're not talking about simply angels who guard, as in the case of Daniel or the apostles. The denominational doctrine of guardian angels goes far beyond this. And it says that God assigns an angel to each person or each believer, depending on whether you're talking about the Catholic or the Protestant version of the doctrine, And it is the responsibility of this angel to guide and protect his ward in all situations separate and apart from the teaching of the Scriptures. Now let's repeat that one more time so we understand exactly what we're talking about. The denominational view of guardian angels is that an angel is assigned by God to a person to guard and guide them separate and apart from the Scriptures. And friends, that doctrine is false from beginning to end. It is wholly without biblical support. In fact, it contradicts what the Scriptures have to teach. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, while not making the doctrine of guardian angels a part of their faith system, nonetheless emphasize the doctrine of guardian angels. In fact, we have them largely to thank for that doctrine in the world of Christendom. Roman Catholics believe that each and every person, good or bad, has has an angel assigned to them. Protestants, on the other hand, restrict the role of the guardian angel to believers and children. They do not believe that unbelievers have a guardian angel assigned to them. Muslims believe that God assigns two angels to follow every person who has ever lived. There is one angel who records your good deeds. The second angel records your bad deeds. On the day of judgment, they report to Allah, the Arabic word for God, 
And if the good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, then you are admitted into paradise. Otherwise, you're consigned to hell. There is a version of the doctrine of guardian angels in both Judaism, also in Hinduism. Now, among churches of Christ, there are those who believe that God does indeed assign angels to watch over people, but they rejected the part of the doctrine that suggests that these guardian angels... Uh, guide someone, influence someone separate and apart from the Scriptures. Uh, Restoration scholars like Alexander Campbell, J.W. McGarvey, and B.W. Johnson, and in more recent years, Brother Charles Hodge, have accepted and taught this view of guardian angels. Again, they reject the idea of these guardian angels guiding us, influencing us, separate and apart from the teaching of the Scriptures. But they do believe there is some biblical support for God assigning angels to watch over people. Now, I don't believe the Scriptures teach even that. And we'll give our reasons for that in this and also in the next lesson. Some of the more liberal, progressive writers among us in our modern brotherhood do, on the other hand, accept the view that God uses angels and allows demons, that God Himself, the Holy Spirit Himself, does guide and direct us directly and separately and apart from the Scriptures. Consider, for example, uh, Brother Joe Beam in his best-selling book, Seeing the Unseen. Now, Brother Beam, to be fair, does explicitly reject the idea of a one-to-one assignment of angels to people. But he makes it very clear in that book that he does believe that both angels and demons, that God and the Holy Spirit are in fact fact leading, directing, and influencing us separate and apart from the teaching of the Scriptures. And friends, that's simply false. Now, what are some of the common proof texts that are often used to teach the idea of guardian angels? The most common scripture that I have seen used as a proof text for guardian angels, their sugar stick passage, if you will, is the teaching of Jesus in Matthew chapter 18, verse number 10. Now, if you have your Bibles handy, and I hope that you do, turn over to Matthew chapter 18, read with me the words of Jesus in verse 10. Here the New Testament says, "...take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones." For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now notice the expression, their angels. There you have a plural possessive pronoun, their. In other words, their angels is a reference back to these little ones. These angels belong in some sense to these little ones. And that, we are told, is proof of the doctrine of guardian angels. Well, let's take a closer look at the verse in its context and see if, in fact, that is the case. Let us, first of all, ask the question, to whom is Jesus referring when He speaks of these little ones? To answer that question, we need to back up in the context to verse number 1. Here the New Testament says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Reading through verse number 6. Now it's important to understand that the disciples at this point in time had a very mistaken understanding of the kingdom of heaven. They understood it to be a worldly kingdom, uh, a political state, as the nation of Israel was in Old Testament times. But that's not at all the kingdom of heaven that either the Old Testament prophets proclaimed or that Jesus Himself 
proclaimed. Rather, he taught that he would rule over a spiritual nation. And of course, we know from the teaching of the New Testament that spiritual nation, the kingdom of God, is in fact one and the same with the church of Christ. So they were wanting to know who was going to have the greatest authority. They knew that Jesus would be king, but after that, who would have the favored positions of power? Now Jesus tries on many occasions to change their thinking on this and get them to see the truth of the matter. So he brings a little child and he sets them in the midst of them and says, here is the key to true greatness in God's kingdom. If, unless you become converted and have the same childlike trust in God that these little children have in their parents, then you will not see, the, you will not be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. We have to be converted and we have to become in our thinking, in our faith, just as a little child. We need to have that same childlike trust. So when we come to verse number 10 and we ask the question again, who are the little ones to whom these angels belong? Then we can conclude, number one, it's possible he's talking about actual children. Or more likely he's talking about believers who have a childlike trust in God. Or possibly he's talking about both. Now, what does it mean to say that these little ones have their angels? I want to note in the first place that Jesus does not mention a one-to-one relationship of angels to children or angels to believers. Neither does He mention that they guide and direct their charges separate and apart from the Word of God. Furthermore, notice that these angels are in heaven, not on earth. Again, Jesus spoke of that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now, the expression, their angels, with reference to these little ones, does of course suggest a special interest that heaven takes in these little ones, whether we're talking about children or whether we're talking about disciples with that childlike trust. And that's exactly the point that Jesus is making. This passage is not teaching the denominational doctrine of guardian angels. It is simply saying that if heaven takes such a great interest in their welfare, then friends and brethren, so also should we. And we should do everything within our power to encourage and support and protect them and do nothing to cause them to stumble or sin. Now that's the point of the passage. It is not talking about so-called guardian angels. Now let's look at another verse that is very commonly used to support the idea of guardian angels. And it's in Psalm 34, verse number 7. And I want you to turn over there with me also, if you would. Psalm 34, verse number 7. Here the writer, inspired psalmist David wrote, The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear Him and delivers them. So here we are told we have clear proof of guardian angels. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear Him and delivers them. Now again, it's important to set this verse in its context. Read with me, if you will, the superscription of Psalm 34. Now these superscriptions are not part of the inspired text. In other words, the Holy Spirit did not write inspired David to write this superscription. But they are ancient and they are widely considered by scholars to give an accurate background to the writing of the psalm. Consider this superscription then. A psalm of David when he pretended madness before Abimelech who drove him away and he departed. Now let's take just a moment and look at the historical record there in 1 Samuel chapter 21. It's not one of David's better moments. 1 Samuel chapter 21. And we'll read verses 10 through 15. Here the Bible says, Then David arose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Achish the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David the king of the land? 
Did they not sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? Now David took these words to heart, and was very much afraid of Achish the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them, feigned madness in their hands, scratched on the doors of the gate, and let his saliva fall down on his beard. Then Achish said to the servants, Look, you see the man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of madmen, or that you, are, that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in, this, in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? You see, David really quickly realized that in fleeing from Saul, he had gone from the frying pan into the proverbial fire. He's fleeing the wrath of King Saul. He goes to Achish, the Philistine king of Gath. Now, the Philistines are the ancient enemies of the Israelites to begin with. David makes the matter worse, of course. His reputation precedes him. So they're already fearful that he is an enemy come to attack them. They don't yet realize he's seeking refuge from King Saul. But to compound his error, if you read back to verse number 9, you see that David rides into town carrying the sword of their slain champion Goliath, who is from Gath. Now what an insult that would be on top of everything else. Well, David quickly realizes he needs to get out of here. How to do it? Well, as you see very quickly here, he pretends to be insane, foams at the mouth like a rabid dog. Now, if Psalm 34 and verse 7, which David wrote against this background, teaches guardian angels, then I would ask, did David's guardian angel cause him to make a fool of himself on this occasion? Well, I think we would obviously say no to that question. What then is Psalm 34, 7 teaching? It is teaching that, or David is in this psalm thanking God for delivering him from Achish, not because of his foolishness, but in spite of it. No, friends, this passage again, set in its context, is not talking about guardian angels. It is simply suggesting, yes, when it is the will of God, angels can be sent to protect and encamp around those who fear Him. But to suggest that it teaches that every believer has a guardian angel aside to Him, or every child or every person has one, or that there is guidance separate and apart from the Word of God supplied by these guardian angels is again to go far beyond what the text itself teaches. Now let's look at a similar passage in the third place, a third misapplied proof text. And this is in Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. Psalm 91 is one of those anonymous psalms. About half the psalms do not have an author's name attached to them. But it is a messianic hymn. And in verses 11 and 12, we read this. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And they shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now, again, friends, we need to note that when we're dealing with the Psalms, we are dealing with passages that teach the truth, but do so in highly figurative and poetic language. And this is a case in point. Read the next verse, verse 13, and this will be very clear. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Now, do you think the psalmist is literally telling people to go out and play with lions and cobras? Well, of course not. Many people would be injured if not outright killed by playing with such deadly beasts. What is the psalmist suggesting to us? That again, that God in a general way looks out for His faithful children. And the Bible teaches that and gives examples of that repeatedly. Again, note though, there is no one-to-one assignment of angels to people here. There's no suggestion of guidance and direction separate and apart from the Word of God. Furthermore, you note that the word angels is in the plural, not the singular. Multiple angels can be used by God when it is His will, as in the case of Daniel or in the apostles that we looked at at the beginning of the lesson, that they be delivered. And He will in those instances send out His angels and they will have charge over you. But to suggest this is a continual state of affairs is to go beyond what the Scriptures teach. And brethren and friends, here is an essential point we need to remember. Both of these psalms are teaching us to put our trust in God, not in angels. 
remember that angels are simply the servants of God. They do, they carry out His will. It is God we must put our trust in, not the angels. And so we need to understand that once again, to suggest that this passage is teaching the denominational doctrine of guardian angels is to reach a conclusion that is simply not sustained by the text itself. Now let's look at a fourth passage very quickly in the New Testament in the book of Acts. Chapter 12, and we'll read together verse number 15. Acts chapter 12, verse number 15. Here the Bible says, But they said to her, You are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, It is his angel. Now again, let's set this verse in context. In Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Herod the king has James the apostle arrested and put to death. Seeing that this pleased the Jewish authorities, he also had Peter arrested and put into prison and intended to have him executed as well after the days of unleavened bread. God, however, sent an angel who miraculously delivered Peter from prison. Peter then makes his way to the home of a Christian woman by the name of Mary, who is the mother of John Mark, who would go on to write the second gospel, the book of Mark. Peter knocks on the door and a servant girl named Rhoda comes to the gate to answer the door. She sees that it's Peter and in her joy, she slams the door in his face, runs inside and delivers this message. And yet they don't believe her. And that brings us back to verse 15. But they, that is the Christians meeting in Mary's house, said to her, that's Rhoda, you are beside yourself. In other words, Rhoda, you've lost your mind. Peter's in prison. He can't be standing out there knocking at the gate. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said it is his angel. Now this again has caused some to conclude that Peter had a guardian angel. That what she wasn't seeing was actually Peter, but it was his guardian angel who evidently had assumed his likeness on that occasion. Now I mentioned a moment ago that Brother J.W. McGarvey accepted the view that God assigned angels to guard individuals, although he rejected the view that said they guided separate and apart from the Word of God. But even Brother McGarvey in his original commentary on Acts noted that this passage does not teach guardian angels. It simply is a reflection of the uninspired views of the Christians who met in Rhoda's house. If you read some of the intertestamental Jewish literature, you will find that there is a lot of fanciful and unbiblical teaching about angels. And this no doubt had influenced some of these Jewish brethren who were meeting in Mary's house. They may have accepted the view of, of guardian angels, but it does not follow that the text is teaching that. It is simply reflecting the views of the brethren on that occasion. And I believe, as Brother McGarvey believed, that they were simply in error on that occasion. Now, let's look at one final passage that is often cited as proof of the denominational doctrine of guardian angels. And that is Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 14. Now, this is a passage that we have often referred to in our study of angels. Sadly, this is one instance where it is being misapplied. In Hebrews 1.14, the inspired writer asked this question of angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? The American Standard Version says that the angels are sent forth to minister on behalf of those who will inherit salvation. Now again, notice that the expression ministering spirits, a reference to angels, is plural, not singular. So that would militate against the idea that there is a one-to-one -one assignment of angels to humans. Rather, multiple ministering spirits are sent forth. And that's another important point. If the guardian angel has already been assigned to us, then he doesn't need to be sent forth from heaven to work on our behalf. Friends, this passage teaches that in a providential way, in a non-miraculous 
invisible, behind-the-scenes way, angels act as God's secret agents carrying out His will. As we noted in an earlier lesson, they will not speak to us. They will not appear to us in a miraculous way. They will not do anything supernatural. They will, as Hebrews 13 2 says, uh, behave unwittingly. That is, in such a way as not to reveal themselves as angels. That is the way angels work in the world today. The passage does teach that God uses angels to carry out His providential will, that they act as His servants and ours. But it does not teach the denominational view of guardian angels. Again, note there is no suggestion in the verse that angels guide and direct us separate and apart from the Word of God. Instead, the Bible teaches they are sent forth repeatedly according to the grammar there in the Greek text. Again, if they're always there, they wouldn't need to be sent forth repeatedly from heaven to earth in order to carry out the orders of heaven. And so, friends, here are some texts that are commonly misapplied where the doctrine of guardian angels is concerned. In our next lesson, as we continue to answer the question, do you have a guardian angel? We will present some logical and scriptural arguments that will refute the denominational doctrine of guardian angels. Thank you for your very kind attention. We hope you'll be back with us for our next lesson. Thank you.